However, at this stage, knowledge of the thing is still not complete. It must be known not only from the standpoint of the immediacy of being and determinateness, but also as essence or inner being as self. This occurs in moral self-consciousness. This is aware that its knowledge is a knowledge of what is absolutely essential. It knows that being is simply and solely pure willing and knowing it is nothing else, but this willing and knowing anything else has only unessential being that is not intrinsic being only it's empty husk. In the same measure that moral self-consciousness lets determinate being go free from the self. So too, in its conception of the world, it takes it back again into itself. Finally, as conscience, it is no longer the continual alternation of existence being placed in the self and vice versa. It knows that its existence as such is this pure certainty of itself, the objective element into which it puts itself forth when it acts is nothing other than the self's pure knowledge of itself. In this short but dense paragraph 792, what we're seeing worked out, not completely because some of it's gonna wait until the next paragraph, particularly the dimension of action. But what we're seeing worked out here is the second of the two other moments that were mentioned in paragraph 790. And you know, what were these two moments? Well, additional parts of the massive historical dialectic of the development of consciousness in the phenomenology so far. So one of those was what we just went through in 791, looking at um, the realm of self-alienated spirit, right? And so that was a significant portion of the phenomenology. And what we're gonna be looking at in this paragraph now, 792, is what comes directly after that, the section that is titled morality, moralitet, right? Which is distinct from ethical life, uh, the earlier section in the spirit portion. And there's a lot to say here about what we're actually doing, but what we should remind ourselves of is that in absolute knowing from the very beginning of this section, Hegel has been telling us that really two really important things. And then a third thing that we're going to get to later, which I might leave a little bit undefined because I don't want it to be a spoiler, but maybe we'll talk about it. So what is the first thing? Well, all of the developments are essentially finished. We've gone through all of these sections with consciousness, very abstract, and then self-consciousness, which was kind of an interesting jump, uh, a little bit more concrete. You know, we start getting away from just life itself and uh, self-consciousness and its meaning and the master-slave dialectic and into stoicism, skepticism, and unhappy consciousness. Then we get into the, the massive reason section. We talked about that with observing reason, but there's more going on in there as well. And then we get to the spirit section, even longer. You could say even more stuff going on, relatively more concrete than the earlier sections, a little bit more, let's say historical, right? And then we get to religion, which is also a big section and rather schematic in how Hegel develops the different kinds of religion, right? But leading ultimately up to Christianity and then uh, the overcoming of representation or picture thinking, foreshelling, and then we get to absolute knowing. So, so the heavy lifting, you could say, has been done already up to this point. And now what we're doing is we're actually looking back retrospectively at some of these sections, just a selection, as you notice. And we could raise all sorts of interesting questions. Why those and not these instead? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, we have to retrace 
the steps that spirit as consciousness, as self-consciousness, as the hopefully soon reconciliation of consciousness and self-consciousness, which by the way was talked about in the very beginning of the religion section, wasn't it? And towards the end of it as well. All of this has to be re reworked, but not too much. You notice that Hegel is rather summary. And, you know, this leads us to the uh, very important conception of Aufheben, this sublation or transcending well, preserving the important moments of that which you're effectively leaving behind or leaving in the background, the development, the previous stuff. And then, you know, we could talk about a third thing. I mean, would it be properly Hegelian if we didn't have a triad here? <laughs> we could joke around a little bit about that and say the key in absolute knowing is to have a knowing of knowing, a knowing of what it is that spirit has been up to, to this point. What we, as the phenomenologist readers, following along with Hegel, the phenomenologist writer and thinker, have before us as achievements of spirit or mind up to this point, now it's time to actually assimilate those and integrate them, which hopefully, you know, we do by the end. We still have quite a few paragraphs of this section, this last section of the phenomenology to go. And we should remind ourselves too that the phenomenology as Hegel intends it at the time is not the absolute end of his systematizing or even of his system, right? We have further books that are going to come about. We have additional developments. Even we could say in the lectures that cover some of the same ground. As we saw, for example, when thinking about the religion section, uh, Hegel fills in quite a few interesting gaps. Okay, so that's enough preface right there about what this, you know, what the overall task is for this section. Now let's zero back in on this particular paragraph. So he tells us, however, at this stage, what stage? Well, the stage that we're moving into next, which is going to be looking at moral self-consciousness and conscience, right? So we're leaving behind the, well, are we leaving behind? Yes and no. These other stages or rather shapes of consciousness that we have now traversed several times. And, and again, if you permit me a little bit of a digression before jumping straight into the text itself, we should realize that the structure of the phenomenology is not purely linear, right? It's not as if we, well, putting aside the preface, which is its own, uh, whole can of worms uh, and talking about, you know, the introduction. Okay. The introduction is kind of interesting uh, as an introduction, nice and short, easy to grasp. We have consciousness and then these three stages within it, you know, as we see right here, sense, certainty, perception, force, and the understanding. Uh, then we have self-consciousness with two of its uh, sections there. Then we have the whole reason section. So, when we go through the consciousness section, for example, we do so at the start and we do so in great detail, right? And there's all sorts of surprises along the way. That's part of the dialectical process. We start out with, oh, I think this is the way it is. We finally reached our stable finish point and now we understand things. And then Hegel says, well, let me pull the rug out from underneath and things get more complicated. So we make it through that. Does that mean that it's over? I mean, it might seem that way given the abrupt jump between uh, consciousness and self-consciousness. As a number of people have pointed out, the transitions between these massive sections or portions of the work are not all that necessary to use a uh, term Hegel loves to bring up, you know, there's not a, there's not as much, if there is a necessity or notwendigkeit to this transition from one to the next, 
Uh, Hegel doesn't do a super job in making it completely explicit. However, what we see is that at multiple points in the work, we've got the previously traversed, dug through section, and it does get sublated, brought into at a higher level, both of abstraction and of context and meaning, other sections. So Hegel will reference back to the previous section, most notably in the very beginning of religion, where he says that all four of these threads are drawn together into a knot, right? And we do see the sense certainty, perception, force in the understanding getting rehearsed again uh, just earlier in paragraph 789, right? So we can say the same thing with a lot of these other sections. We're going back over them. And each time we do it, it's sort of like listening to a musical composition. We notice more or traversing a landscape, going along a trail. We see more than we saw the previous time. I think the music one is probably better in part because we're not bringing in, you know, the seasons or stuff like that and how things change going from spring to summer to fall to winter, uh, be that as it may. So let, let's talk about what we've got here. So we've already in the, you know, last, so 789 to 791, traversed these sections. It, it, we've, we've, brought them up, we've remembered them, to use the phrase erinnern that Hegel used before. So the consciousness section, explicit reference to sense certainty, which we're also going to see uh, here you know, soon, perception, right, the thing that comes after that, and then the very complicated, difficult understanding, meaning force in the understanding, and the various worlds that are involved. So far, so good, right? And then we jump right into observing reason, which is the first part of the reason section. Okay, that makes perfect sense. We don't, interestingly, talk about, in this uh, summary, we don't talk about the other portions of reason, right? Namely, section B, the actualization of rational self-consciousness through its own activity, which includes some pretty important ethical stuff, right? or individuality which takes itself to be real in and for itself, which gives us the spiritual animal kingdom. Then the very uh, Kant-infused reason is lawgiver, reason is testing laws. Um, we're leaving that aside. And similarly, we're not referencing the self-consciousness section here, which you know is pretty big, pretty important. Notice that Hegel doesn't think we need to talk about that as we're traversing remembering these previous shapes of consciousness at this point. And then we get self-alienated spirit. So we don't get the whole spirit section, right? He's not beginning with the whole Antigone dynamic uh, at the beginning of the spirit section, the true spirit, the ethical order, right? Zitlikite. We're jumping right into section B, self-alienated spirit, culture. Right, And what do we get in there? We get culture and the realm of actuality. Not talking about that. What we do get is the dialectic of faith and pure insight, but really just talking about pure insight. And then we get the enlightenment. Uh, but what else don't we get? Absolute freedom and the terror. Why is that passed over? Well, uh, maybe we don't need it at this point for where we're going. So we should think about where we are going. We're going to be now talking about moral self-consciousness, right? So moralitia, selbstbewusstsein, or the moralitet, morality section, uh, which does lead into ultimately conscience, not just conscience in that section, right? That is where we encounter more uh, uh, bits and pieces, the beautiful soul, evil and its forgiveness, which we're going to talk about in uh, the, the, the paragraphs to come, actually right after this paragraph. So you know, just hold on to that, right? So what does he have to say about this particular section? At this stage, knowledge, wissen, of the thing, the, the, you know, the, the ding, is still not complete. It's not vollendet, not perfected, not brought to its fruition. 
It's not complete, uh, not in the sense of like ticking off boxes, but not complete in the sense of a full and complete development that integrates everything together. Why not? Well, now here with this contrast, um, we have the we have a sort of a backwards reference to what went on in the previous paragraphs, right? Just think about uh, what went on in 791 towards the end. Um, you know, talking about sense certainty to be absolute truth, but this being for self is itself declared to be a moment that merely vanishes and passes over into its opposite. Why? Because it's empty. It's, it's uh, nothing into a being that is at the disposal of another, being for another, right? Um, so that's on this side, the immediacy, the unmittelbarkeit of being, sein, and determinateness, bestimmtheit, taking on characteristics, particular characteristics. The knowledge of the thing is partly knowing that side of it. You could call this, as Hegel's going to, it's, it's shell, it's outer, right? And then what do we have on the other side as we go into it? Now, remember too, as we talk about this, we're not just talking about the thing as the external thing of observing reason. We're thinking about ourselves and spirit itself and history as the thing. So what do we got on the other side? Essence, Wesen, what is important, what is central, what it really matters, what has meaning. It's inner being, inneres, right? So that's important as well. And both of these are involved, as he says, self, selbst. And he says this occurs in moral self-consciousness, not just moral consciousness, although you know, could you actually have just moral consciousness from a Hegelian perspective? You could certainly have ethical consciousness, uh, watching what somebody else does or seeing the consequences of your behavior and having some sort of uh, affective value response. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's bad, right? But to grasp your action, your willing, your comportment, your character as your own, as belonging to a self, there has to be self-consciousness. And I'd like to actually pause another slight digression. I've said this many times throughout this commentary on the phenomenology. Hegel is a great speculative theoretical thinker. But for him, consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, these are not merely abstract, theoretical sorts of matters. We are always spirit within the world, a world in which we act and suffer and engage others and compare and contrast and justify or sometimes don't justify and feel bad as a result. So moral self-consciousness in a certain way is, is more self-consciousness than just the you know, abstract. Well, self-consciousness always exists in relation to another self-consciousness from the self-consciousness section. You know, there was something that got uh, brought up over and over again in the reason section in these portions that we've left out here at this point, the uh, project or the thing that matters most, right? The ethical project, the, which transforms into the moral project over time. So what does moral self-consciousness do? What is it consistent according to Hegel? He tells it, this is, now here's a little, a little bit of a quibble about translation. This is aware. No, it's not aware. It knows. Weiss. That's the word that Hegel actually uses here. Weiss. Wissen. It, it, this is its knowledge at work, right? So it knows that its knowledge is of what is absolutely essential. Absoluta Wesenheit. Not Wesen as such. Wesenheit. What is essential? What bears 
essentiality, what, you know, the condition of being essential. So moral self-consciousness isn't just knowledge or uh, self or consciousness of the dimensions of the self that, you know, are, are, we could say trivial or don't matter. You might think, I'm not saying that this is Kantian at this point, I'm just using Kant as an example. We could use Thomas Aquinas as an example or Anselm as an example for this sort of thing as well. When Kant says, if you're going to act, consider the maxim that you're acting on. What is a maxim? It is a rule, but also a descriptor for what the hell you're doing, what it is that you're contemplating and being drawn to or being repulsed by. This is what you know Thomas Aquinas would frame in terms of the moral species or ethical species type of an act, right? The maxim determines that. And, and I determine that in my own action with my moral self-consciousness, um, knowing what the essential thing is about what I'm doing. If I go and uh, give food to a beggar, what kind of action is that really? We have to describe it properly. And I brought up Anselm. You see him doing this over and over again in his works. Um, proper uh, description of what is of the essence of the action from a moral perspective. That is involved in moral self-consciousness, so that's part of its knowledge, right? Going on, what else does it know? It knows, as Hegel is going to tell us here, um, so it's aware its knowledge is a knowledge of what is absolutely essential, or order, it knows that being is solely and simply schlechthin, so it's not as if there's two different terms there in the German, uh, pure, reine, willing, and knowing, right? So he says, als den reinen willen oder wissen. It's interesting here that, that Miller um, changes the or to, to you know, um, something slightly different here, right? Um, simply and solely, pure willing and knowing. Well, it's really simply and solely, pure uh, willing and or knowing, right? Oda there. Now, does this matter much? I mean, I think that what there's a disjunction that's happening there. And I actually think that the or makes these things a little bit closer. You can look at it this way, or you can look at it this way. But really, these are both intimately connected with each other. And then he doesn't say that it knows this, but I think that we can put this under the aspect of knowledge, that it, namely moral self-consciousness, is nothing else than this willing and knowing, right? Anything else, as he says, has only unessential being, not intrinsic being, only its empty husk. That's this. That is the immediacy of being and determinateness, right? That is the uh, nothing or the emptiness that we saw mentioned in the previous paragraphs, I think, right? So this is what moral self-consciousness is bringing to the table and hopefully something that all of us at this stage of the dialectic possess and now can think about. And then we go on to yet another part of this. This is all part of the moment that this paragraph is bringing up that was referenced back in 790. So he says, um, well, before he says that, he says, um, in the same measure that moral self-consciousness lets determinate being go free from the self, so too in its conception of the world it takes, back, takes it back into itself. So, you know, it thinks uh, the determinate being is who I am, right? I think of myself, we might even think about the self-alienation that's overcome here, right? I think of myself as the person who knows, wills, does, feels, um, hopes for, pick up whatever modality you want in determinate ways. And then I abstract from that and then I come back to it again. And then we get to conscience. 
he says, finally, as conscience, now notice what happens here. We have an integration. It is no longer this continual alternation of existence, Dasein, being placed in the self and vice versa. Uh, you know, the translation there, Miller's translation, is getting a little bit away from the German because what he says is abwechselnden, ab right? So alternation works there, or exchange, right? Wechseln is exchange. Um, stellen und Verstellen. Stellen is to put something down in place, uh, to establish something. Verstellen is very close to vorstellen, <laughs> representation, but it's not representation, right? So um, stellen and verstellen, almost like a little uh, rhyme there. And it's talking about the relationship between the self and Dasein or existence being there, right? This is Heidegger's term, but Hegel uses it in that sense as well. So uh, it is no longer this <coughs> continual alternation of existence being placed in the self. It knows that its existence as such, als solche, is this pure certainty of self. And again, we want to look at the what's actually being said here. Reiner, pure. Gewissheit, yes, certainty, right? And notice that Gewissheit and Gewissen very, very close together, as we remarked back in that section. Seine selbst. So certainty of self, certainty of its very own self. Seine selbst, right? A little bit more intensified there. Conscience, when it's genuinely conscience, is telling you who you are and what you're doing and the meaning of it, right? It's part of, it's a growth out of moral self-consciousness. So he says, the objective element into which it, what is it? Conscience puts itself forth when it acts. Notice we finally have gotten to action here, handeln, uh, to behave, to comport oneself, to act not just uh, in terms of uh, doing one thing, but meaningful action, we could say. Now we have uh, uh, knowledge and willing and action, the things that go together in the morality section over and over again, when it acts, is nothing other than the self's pure knowledge of itself. That's a very interesting way to end, isn't it? When it acts, when it doesn't just will, but that will moves out into the messy world of human beings and our desires and consequences and all of that, that sort of stuff that ethical action involves. Now it becomes, as he says, the self's pure knowledge of itself. Now we could read this as, oh, it suddenly becomes abstract, but we could also read it as this is how the self's pure knowledge of itself transforms itself into something that has existence, has Dasein, has being in the world and has determinate meaning for the one who is engaging in it. We should remind ourselves of one other thing before we, we close this off and get ready for the next paragraph, which is going to consolidate these matters. What did we see in these sections, morality and, and conscience? Well, um, the morality section is actually one of the most interesting portions of the phenomenology for me, in part because when we look at uh, action that is supposed to be moral, we see there's so many different components to it, so many different dimensions to it. And you can get this right, but get this wrong or in the very process of focusing on this, you overlook this over here. Nothing like that is, is present in the resolution that's taking place here, but that remains within the background. We can never do morality mechanically, you could say. We have to always be present as thinking, as knowing, as willing beings. So that's arguably what's going on in this short little paragraph. You see that there's quite a lot involved 
just in what we're looking at here. And now we have traversed once again these important portions of the phenomenology that we previously looked at in much greater detail.